Greetings to everyone and welcome to this session on the Gospel of John. This is session number 48. I'm Pastor Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. Joy to be with you today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for making this a part of your day, a part of your, a part of your time. Uh, as I say in my podcast, you know, time is our greatest investment. Time is our greatest commodity. We have a limited amount of it. And so for you to invest your time in this, thank you for that. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for being part of this journey. If you are listening to us for the first time, then welcome. It is a joy to have you here. Thanks for being part of it. And please finish through the end of the session. You're going to get a lot out of it. And then go back and listen to the previous sessions. We've been walking through the Gospel of John since the very beginning, since verse 1, chapter 1, all the way up to this point. We're now ready to finish chapter 17 today. So there's a lot of information out there, a lot of a lot of pieces. So I would encourage you to check it out, go back and listen to some of the previous sessions. Uh, but I definitely would encourage you to stay and listen to this session. However it came to you, thanks be to God that it came to you. Uh, whether someone shared it with you or whether you just happened to find it online, whatever. Uh, I'm happy that you're here. Thank you. And for those of you who are joining us again, who are have been following along, welcome back. It's great to have you. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for making this work a part of your life at this point in time. Again, as I've said many times before, you know, it is our proclamation that moves the gospel forward. It is the work that we do that moves the gospel forward. It is not some kind of great um, rain down from God every 40 years, but God has looked to us throughout the centuries to carry the word forward. And this is how we do it, by learning it, by studying it. And we're just happen to be, we happen to be in a time and a place where you don't even need to leave your home. You can get the word uh, from me or from thousands, hundreds of thousands of other people uh, just through your computer, uh, just by clicking on a little bit of this or a little bit of that. So it's great. Uh, You know, we're really lucky and we're really blessed, but it's also increases the mandate and the responsibility of us to continue to proclaim and reach out and and move the gospel forward. That's our primary mandate. That's our primary call and our primary responsibility. So thank you for being part of this. Thank you for being part of this journey. Uh, If you connected with us through any of the social media sites. Uh, I know this gets posted to my, fa- my my YouTube page, so I would certainly encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube page if you haven't already. Uh, so that way, when, you, when future posts come up, it's going to alert you automatically. That's what happens when you subscribe to a YouTube follower or YouTube channel. Then when new content comes up, then you automatically get a notification. So thank you for that. I certainly would encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube page. Also, I would definitely say that... Um, you know that if you connecting the, through this through one of the social media platforms if you found us through the Facebook page or the Instagram page or Twitter, please uh, share us. Please get it out there. The more that we're able to use these platforms, these social media platforms for the good of the gospel, the more we're able to share this stuff out there, the more we're able to inundate the world, not only with the good news of Jesus Christ, but we're able to open up uh, the possibilities and the accents. I mean, listen, I, I know it, it may not make m- a whole lot of sense, but whenever you're on any kind of social media site, you are getting inundated with ads and with ideas and with impressions. So I would just encourage you to share this out because this is at least one good piece of information, one good link, one good moment, some time for people to be able to engage the word in a way that's different, engage the world in a way that's different. So definitely share it out there, get it out there so that others can engage it. Use the platform that you have and use the platform that you got this information from for moving the information forward. So, so you know, we there's a lot of conversation out there about how uh, social media is detrimental. And there's some detrimental stuff out on social media, but it doesn't have to be. Social media is a tool. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, they're tools. And how we use those tools depends on what happens with them, like a hammer. A hammer can build a house and it can break a window. So use the tool that you have before you for good. Use the tool to make a difference and do that by sharing this stuff out there, by inundating Facebook and inundating Instagram with the good stuff and tag us. And I'd love to see where you're at. I'd love to see where you're connecting uh, through so that we can follow along and, and, and maybe know where to give a little bit more energy, a little bit more love. So I'd love to know where you're at. Um, and, uh, 
If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'd be happy to do whatever I can to help, you know, bring about some um, bring about some 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 clarity or or clear up some questions. My contact will come up at the end of the session, and uh, I'd love to hear from you. I really would. So definitely, as I've said before, make sure you have a Bible open before you. I don't care what kind of translation it is, paraphrase. That doesn't matter whether it's digital or paper. Again, that doesn't matter. Just have the Bible open before you. Have the Word open before you, if at all possible. Now, if you're listening to me at the gym or um, if you're listening to me in the car, then thank you. I definitely appreciate that. And uh, certainly I don't want you driving and reading or you know doing leg presses and reading. But if you can have a Bible open before you, then awesome. If you're, if you're doubling, if you're habit stacking this, if you're listening to this while you're doing something else, I totally get it. And I'm just as appreciative of that. Uh, so, so you know, I, I really want you to continue to engage. And, of course, if you can have the Bible open, I definitely encourage that. It doesn't matter what paraphrase or translation you use. I use the New Revised Standard Version. But you can use whatever's available to you. Uh, whatever works for you, you can use that. Um, but just whatever it is, if you can have something open uh, so that you can read along, you can follow along with what we're talking about here. Now, we're in the Gospel of John. Uh, the Gospel of John is the fourth book in the New Testament. The Bible is divided in the Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament is the story of creation up into uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. And the New Testament is the birth of Jesus Christ through the crucifixion and resurrection on to the beginning of the church and on to the end of the age. So we're in the New Testament right now. We're studying the New Testament right now. We're in the Gospel of John. John is the fourth book in the New Testament, and we are in the 17th chapter right now. So we are really late in the farewell discourse. Okay, we're going to end the farewell discourse today. Uh, next week, we're going to kick into, and we actually may start into it today a little bit. We'll see how far we go and how long it takes for us to wander through this point. But we're going to end the farewell discourse today. We're going to end this private teaching that Jesus has with his disciples uh, as he gets ready to go to his crucifixion. Now, one of the things I certainly want to remind you, and I've reminded this a lot, but I want to make sure that we're very clear as we come to the end of this section, this portion, and we move into what's coming next. This is all designed by God. This is all planned by God. So the things that happen next will move pretty fast. You know, when we get into the passion, it moves pretty quickly. Um, and But there's so much to it. There's so much involved in it. But what I want you to know uh, going into it is that Jesus is coming to the end of the farewell discourse. This is all by plan. This is all by design. None of this is by accident. Jesus doesn't in any way, shape or form get duped or made fun of or, or cajoled, or he doesn't get the wool pulled over at his eyes, whatever, whatever, you know, you want to say, that's not what happens here. What happens here is a conscious choice of the maker of heaven and earth incarnate word made flesh to go to the end of his public ministry and die for the sake of the world. So we're coming to the end of the public minister, coming end of the farewell discourse. And that's what we're going to look at today as we see Jesus wrapping up his earthly ministry prior to his arrest and crucifixion. So we are in chapter 17, John 17, verse 20 and following. And Jesus says, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who were believing in me through their word, that they may be one, that they may all be one as you father are um, in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you and me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. All right. So the, the last portion that we talked about um, was this whole this relationship that Jesus talks about, about the disciples that, you know, he is in the disciples. The disciples are in him. He is in God. They are in God. So so there's really this intimacy, this very intimate connection between the disciples and Jesus, Jesus and God, God and the disciples. OK, and it has to be, you know, again, I, 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 I stated this pretty clearly before, but I'll state it again. You know, this idea of intimacy with God is so foreign to the Israelite mind in the time of 
with Jesus. It's not foreign to us. You know, we have this idea of a God who who leans in, listens close. And even when we read the Old Testament pieces, like the Psalms particularly, we get a picture of a God who's very intimate, very connected. But the fact is, the temple cult, the rulers, the ones who really were getting the money and the power from overseeing the work of God, they're the ones that created this distant, uncaring God. They're the ones that created this God who's out there and that doesn't care and that doesn't matter. They're the ones that created this idea that God is aloof and just waiting to be wrathful on you. That's what the Pharisees and the scribes wanted. And it it, it went for hundreds of years. I mean, that idea went for hundreds of years. So because it went for hundreds of years, there was then no real identity. There was no real idea of this intimate God, of this God of intimacy, this God who is connected and there. That idea just wasn't lasting. It wasn't part of the fabric of faith. Okay? So... Um, What Jesus is bringing is Jesus is bringing this idea of a very intimate God. Jesus is bringing the idea of a very intimate God who is very much connected. All right. And he talked about this. He talks about this as I'm in them and they're in me and you're in me and I'm in you. So put it all together. and, And what we have is we have this God of intimacy. I have given them your world, your word. The world has hated them. You have protected them. So, so what Jesus is basically saying is, look, these are my guys. I'm in you, you're in me, so I want you to be in them, okay? I want you to protect them. Now, remember we talked before that Jesus is going to give the advocate. The Father's going to send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, uh, but not until after Jesus leaves. So, so the advocate is going to be there. The advocate is going to be there. The Holy Spirit is going to be present, and that's awesome, and we need that, and we love that, and we certainly want that. So the advocate is going to be present. The Holy Spirit is going to be there. Um, but also Jesus saying, look, God, I want you to be part of what we're doing here. I want you to be part of their lives. I want you to be part of their journey, their struggle. So Jesus is calling out. Jesus is saying to God, you know, be one, be present with them, be present with them, be part of their journey, part of their struggle, part of their life, because this is what it means to be, to be together. All right. Again, there's this intimacy that 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 the disciples just have no knowledge of. They have no generational knowledge of. You and I, like I said, you and I, we're lucky because we have this generational knowledge of the love and grace of Jesus Christ. We have this generational knowledge that the rest of that, that many of us know, and we've known it for uh, it's been taught to us. But the disciples don't have that. The disciples don't have that generational knowledge. They don't have that generational love. So where they're at and where uh, they're going. So what Jesus is saying to God is like, God, be with them. Be with them. Be part of their journey. Don't leave them alone. You know, we can go back to like Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. You're on your staff. They come from me. You're, you're present with me in the midst of even the most painful and difficult things. That's the promise given to us in, um, in God. And that is the promise that, that God is talking about here. Be with them. That's what he's asking. And he goes on to say, I'm not only, I'm not, I ask not only for the, on behalf of these, these being the 12, these being the ones that are right in front of me. And this is a really important part. This is where it all kind of lays out how Jesus wants his church to grow. Okay. And that's where we're at. And this is what he says. I asked, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Okay. So the intention, the very foundational intention of the community of faith, the very foundational intention of the church is that it will be passed on from generation to generation via the word and the proclamation. That is what is being said here. That is what Jesus is saying. Look, because of the word, this is how it's going to work out. This is what I'm saying. The word will be passed on from generation to generation. My story will be passed on from generation to generation. That's how this is going to work out. My story will be passed on from generation to generation because that's what I want it to be. 
that's how this is going to play out. So what we see here, what we see here is we see Jesus setting in motion how the church is going to expand and grow. And Jesus sets in motion how the church is going to expand and grow by indicating that not only will it go from generation to generation, be passed down, but the expectation is that it will be unified. It will be a unified proclamation. Now, you know, let, let's, let, let's kind of put a pin on it here for just a minute um, and understand that there's a big difference in the world between unity and conformity. We tend to get confused about that. We tend to think that unity and conformity are one in the same, but they're actually not, okay? So conformity is everybody believing, doing, acting, looking, being the exact same. That's conformity, okay? That's what it means to conform. Um, if you want to think about a, uh, a historical example of that, you know, you can think about the conformity of Nazi Germany, okay? And, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the Nazis and how they all uh, came into conformity, all right? So that's not what Jesus wants. Jesus isn't interested in conformity. Jesus is interested in unity. And now the difference between the two, unity means that we agree on a major point, and then we have the freedom within that agreement to live out that major point in different ways, in our own expression. So let's, let's, let, let me give you a concrete example. Um, you know, we're all unified in Jesus Christ and we're all unified in the idea that we worship God in thanksgiving for all that God has given us. So that's the unity that we have. But now within that unity, we can find differences. We can say, you know what? I enjoy worship with an organ, or I enjoy worship with a guitar, or I enjoy worship with drums, or I enjoy worship with silence, okay? So regardless of that, regardless of that, so if you, in, so we agree that worship is acceptable, and we agree the unity of worship, but we can find differences and particularities within that agreement. That's where unity is. And, and my form of worship doesn't make it any more right than yours or vice versa or whatever. And you can take it out. You can take it out and say, you know, I prefer, um, uh, you know, I prefer to, to stand for confession versus I prefer to kneel for confession. Again, those are points of, of differentiation within the uniformity. So what Jesus is doing, Jesus is saying, you know, I'm not just asking that you protect and watch over those who you've given to me, but I'm also asking you protect and watch over those who will come to believe in me through their word, through their witness, through their proclamation. And keep in mind, you know, those, those first 300 years of Christian identity, they were plagued with persecution. The Romans were eradicating the Christians. Christianity was illegal in Rome until, until um, Constantine was baptized in approximately 325. So then Christianity was legalized in Rome. Uh, but up until that time, the Christians were persecuted. If you were found to be a Christian, you were fed to the lions, you were burned at the stake, you were tarred and feathered, you were drawn and quartered. Uh, there were so many different things that the Romans did to the Christians. Um, and it's well-documented history. So so Jesus is like, look, I know that, that what we're doing, there's hostility towards it. I mean, there was hostility towards him. So there's no reason to think that there wouldn't be hostility towards those who follow him. So with that being the case, that there would be hostility towards those who follow him, then it's, then it's indicative for Jesus to call upon God to not only protect those who are with him, but also those who will come after following in their word, because there will be persecution, there will be hostility. So Jesus is looking out at the future of the witness of the future of the ministry and saying that the future of the ministry will face persecution. So protect them, guard them. Um, you know, I'm not just asking on behalf of these who are with me, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, that we may be in unity with each other, that the proclamation, the gift of Jesus Christ, the power of, of, of God's work in the world continues on from generation to generation. Cause if it doesn't, then the word will go out. You know, I, I think it was H. George Anderson. Yeah, I think it was H. George Anderson. H. George Anderson or um, Herb Chilstrom. But I think it was H. George Anderson who said that um, the church is one generation away from extinction. Because every generation's responsibility is to pass the church on to the next generation. That's the responsibility of the church. Um, the church doesn't grow 
you know, through uh, through any other means, but the proclamation of those who believe sharing it with others. That's how the church works. So with that being said, with that being said, it's important for us to understand that, that Jesus is praying not only for the disciples of that time, but he's also praying for those who will come after, the generations, all the way down to us, some 2,000 years later. So when we read this, this prayer continues for us. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So so Jesus is praying for this, this unity. He's praying that, that those who believe become part of the kingdom, part of the community, part of the work. So, you know, Paul, when Paul talks about being heirs of the kingdom, children of the kingdom, when Jesus talks about being, you know, early on, he talks about being free. And, you know, if the son makes you free, you're free indeed. If the son makes you free, then the son makes you an heir. Well, this is where all this kind of culminates into. This is where all this culminates into, you know, Jesus and God are one. They come from the same stuff. Homoousius is the word that came out of the Council of Nicaea. The same stuff, all right? So they're of the same origins. Um, And because they're of the same origins, they are one. They are unified. And what Jesus is saying is, look, those who believe in me, make them one with us also. Make them part of what we are doing. Now, part of us is like, woohoo, that's great. We get to be part of what God is doing. And the other part's like, oh, boy. You know, being part of what God's doing means we need to turn away from sin. We need to transform our minds. We need to strive to be better. We need to strive to live into this covenant we have with God in a way that's going to outcast us, that people aren't going to like us, that people are going to make fun of us or turn our back on us or whatever. I mean, there's still modern day persecution that's faced. It's just not feeding to the lion's den. I mean, it's character assassinations and and ostracized and kicked out of social groups or what have you. So, so being a Christian is still not an easy thing. It's easier today than it was, but it's not an easy thing. So, so what Jesus is praying is pray, Jesus is praying that, that we all the way down the line, anybody who witnesses the proclamation, accepts the proclamation, believes in Jesus Christ, will be one with the father and the son just, and be part of what the work of the father and the son are doing part of something bigger. The glory that you have given me, I've given them so that they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me, and they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So, so the glory, and, and, and here's the point, here's the point I want to make sure is very, very clear because this is one of the areas where uh, we can find some struggle But the point I want to make very, very clear is when Jesus talks about glory, he is not talking about resurrection. He is not talking about throne room in heaven. He is talking about suffering and crucifixion. His glory is the cross. So when Jesus talks about glory, he talks about glory through suffering. Okay? So he is saying, look, I want to make sure that they have the same glory that I have. I want, you know, the glory that you have given me, I have given them. The glory of suffering for your name, which you have given me, I have given them. I have given over to them. So the glory that I have is going to be their glory. All right. So their glory is going to be my glory. My glory is my suffering in the face of the world. All right? So we need to make sure that we're very clear that glory, we want to think about glory as as joy, as woohoo, look at everybody, I'm great, you know, flags and parades and 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 little, you know, little whistles. That is not the glory of Christ. The glory of Christ is the cross. Suffering, suffering for the sake of God's mission. So when Jesus says, you know, you, the glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus is like, look, the glory that I want for them is the glory of a willingness to suffer for your kingdom, the glory of a willingness to suffer for your word, uh, for the work that we're doing. I want them to understand that my glory is in suffering and that will be their glory also. They will suffer for the sake 
of the word. They will suffer for the sake of the kingdom. They will experience my glory. So, you know, and and this is really an important part because we've lost a lot of this in our current world and our current understanding. But, you know, suffering is is not an implied part of Christian identity. It's a real part of Christian identity. It's a spoken part of Christian identity. We are going to suffer. If you work for Jesus, if you commit to the word, you will suffer. There will be suffering of some form. Now, some people suffer more than others based on where they're born, when they're born, how outspoken they are, what their gifts are. But we all suffer because of Jesus Christ. That is just how it is. We all suffer because of Jesus Christ. And that's the glory that God is calling us to. God is calling us to the glory of suffering for the sake of the Savior. That's it. Um, you know, and Jesus is like, look, I, I just want to make sure that, 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 and because they're willing to suffer, and here's the thing, because they're willing to suffer for my name, because they're willing to suffer for me, uh, then the world will know that you and I are one and they're one with us. The world will be like, you know, what is it about these people over here that they're willing to suffer? Oh, they're Christians. And here's a God who's willing to suffer for the world. They're willing to suffer for the world. So therefore, they're Christians. There's nothing to indicate that easy street is the answer to um, following Christ. Nothing. As a matter of fact, and I've said this before, uh, most of the, the, all of the disciples, the only disciple that we really know anything about following um, to, to the end really is John because he talks about it in his letters. But um, non-canonical pieces, the stories outside of the Bible themselves, none of the disciples lived to a ripe old age and none of them died a happy death. Okay, they all suffered. Uh, crucifixion, beheading, tar and feathering, burned at the stake, drawn and quartered, crucified upside down. I mean, a lot of icky stuff. So all of these disciples suffered. All of the people who originally followed Christ suffered. Because following Christ changed the world. It was countercultural. And because it was countercultural, the culture is going to make you suffer. Look, how does one keep uh, status quo? Status quo is kept by causing suffering. If you try to break status quo, you'll suffer. That's the work. So if you don't want to suffer, if you don't want to suffer, then just stay online. Just stay along with what you're doing. Follow the rules and nobody's going to suffer. But oftentimes you do suffer. You just suffer in a different way. You suffer internally. You suffer through apathy and hatred and, and just falling apart. Okay, so Jesus is like, look, they're going to suffer, but may the world know in their suffering that we are one, that you and I are one, that that's how it works. Father, I desire that those also whom you've given me may be with me where I am so that, um, sorry, I just lost my place. Uh, Father, I didn't need to see uh, where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So, so see my glory. I want you that I want that. Sorry about that. That happens sometimes. I kind of lost my place as I was reading through it. So I want them to see my glory. I want them to see what this suffering looks like. I want them there. I want their eyes to be on this, which, which really in a lot of ways, I mean, the disciples do witness the crucifixion. They are on the edges, on the margins. They know what the glory of Christ is all about. They know it because they see it. They experience it. But they also know the glory of God. They also know the answer, and the answer is resurrection. They know the suffering, but they also know the glory. All right? So they see it. I want them to see it. I want them to see the glory which you have given me because you love me from the foundation of the world. So two things here, two things that are really important. Foundation of the world. So this is the connection. Again, it's almost the bookend going back to the the prologue. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Nothing came into being through without the word. And the word became flesh and lived among us. So, so Jesus is proclaiming his knowledge that he's been there since the foundation of the world. Okay, he's been there since the foundation of the world. But the other aspect is that to see my glory, which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So to, so to, so to, so to think, you know, how can suffering be a gift given out of love? Hmm. And that's a really hard con concept because we don't necessarily uh, see love and suffering along the same vein. We want to think that love doesn't contain suffering. Um, and, it, and, it, and, and I don't want to wade too much into the philosophical and metaphysical waters of that, but I will say this. 
Why does Jesus say that he gets his glory, which is suffering, because God loved him from the foundation of the world? Suffering has to happen. The son has to suffer and die for the sins of the people. And, and Jesus isn't sent out of hatred, out of apathy. Jesus is sent, the son is sent because God loves the son. Because God knows that the son will answer the call. Because God is confident that the son will not fail. And that's out of love. The son receives this path of suffering because the son loves the father. And the son is committed to the father. The son is committed to do what the father wants. So it is out of love, not out of hatred, that the son receives the gift. It is out of love, not out of hatred. It is not that God hates Jesus. It is that God loves Jesus. And it is out of love that the son receives the glory that is being given to him by the father. Okay. It is out of love, not out of hatred. We don't want to go down the road of thinking that Jesus is being punished in any way. This is not any kind of punishment. Jesus didn't do something wrong, which then leads to his punishment. That's not what's happening here. What's happening here is a pure gift of love poured out from God to the son and then from the son to the people. Okay. So this is a pure gift of love given to us, not a punishment. So Jesus doesn't come down here all hang dogged or mad because he's got to die for the sins of the world. Blah, blah, blah. No, this is love. And Jesus acknowledges that this is love from the foundation of the world, from the foundation of his being. He acknowledges that God loves him. Okay, so we carry on. Uh, This is verse 25 and following. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Again, so, so we're seeing this flow of energy, this flow of love. First, righteous father. That is, that is truly the appropriate term for God. God is righteous. Again, and if we think about Jesus, you know, he's about ready to go to the cross. He's about ready to go do this thing, this awful, terrible thing by choice, by design. So it would be very easy to think that God is punitive or you know, punishing, uh, but God is righteous. This is an act of righteousness, okay? There is no unrighteous action going on here. So we want to make sure that we are clear that what takes place is from the hand of a righteous God, even if we don't like it, okay? Even if we don't think it should be this way, we're not God. We don't see the depth or complexity. We can try, we can try to understand, but we're not God. So we don't see the complexity of what's going on. We don't see the ramifications that are taking place. And since we don't see the ramifications that are taking place or the totality of it all, we have to trust that that God is God. We have to trust that God knows what God is doing um, and that God is going to do what's best for everybody involved. Uh, And so because that's the case, because we believe that God is God and because we believe that God has got everything taken care of, then God is righteous in all things, regardless of the decision. God is righteous. Regardless of the decision, God is righteous and God will remain righteous regardless of the decision. If God decides to wipe us out, God is righteous. If God decides to forgive us all, God is righteous. If God decides something in the middle, God is righteous. That's how it works. And Jesus acknowledges that. Jesus acknowledges that God is righteous, period. That's the way it goes. So God is righteous. Righteous Father, I the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. So Jesus is acknowledging one more time, it's very clear that the world has lost its knowledge of its creator. The world has lost its knowledge of its creator. It doesn't know why it is where it is. And that's, that's why Jesus came into the world, because the people had lost touch with their God. They had lost touch with their creator, um, and they no longer know who God is. The world doesn't know you, but I know you. Of course I know you. I came from you. I'm part of you. I know you. I know you to the core. I know your most intimate being. I know the love you have for your creation. That's what he's saying. 
I know you. And these here that you've given me, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. So they know enough to know that I'm part of you. Okay, They know enough to know that the proclamation coming forth from me is from you. They know enough to know that we are one, that we are part of each other. That's what we know. That's what they know. And that's what we want them to know. I've made your name known to them, and I will make it known to them, and I will make and 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 I will make it known to them so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So so this intensity, this trust, this trust that the suffering that's going to take place is necessary. Look, one of the things we need to understand is when Jesus goes to the cross, when he goes to do what he's going to do, the, the disciples are going to be confused. And then later on, they're going to be confused even more because they're going to be suffering in the name of Jesus. They're going to be suffering for the sake of their faith. And they need to know, they need to know that, that you know, the, they have the love, the same love from Jesus that Jesus has from God. This love that sent Jesus into suffering. This love that sent Jesus into self-denial and and loss. They need to know that they have that same kind of love, that they're part of that same kind of love, that they're part of that same kind of relationship, that God has got them like God has Jesus. Okay. They need to be part of that whole thing. That needs to all be part of the deal. Um, it can't just be a little bit. It needs to be part of the whole. Uh, and, and again, and this is such a hard concept for us because the idea of sending someone that we love out of love to suffering. The idea that suffering is a, an outpouring of love is a really hard thing for us to grasp because somewhere along the line, we've been told, we've been, we've been given this idea that love and suffering don't go hand in hand. But I, I would argue that that's not the case. That really isn't the case, actually, in a lot of ways. Love and suffering, they do. They may not go hand in hand, but they walk side by side. Uh, They walk side by side. And sometimes, you know, love is an outcropping. Um, uh, You know, suffering is an outcropping of love. Um, again, and, and, and to think that we have to suffer for love, that's different. That's different. And, and again, I don't want to get real metaphysical here about this. I don't want to go too, I don't want to wade too far into the weeds here, but just enough to say that what Jesus is saying is I made your name known to them and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. The love that would trust the suffering of the world in my hands. Look, Jesus was trusted by God, loved by God, with suffering for the world. He was trusted that he would be able to suffer for the world. And so now Jesus is saying, look, I'm trusting that same love in them. I'm trusting that they're willing to suffer for the world like I suffered for the world. I'm trusting that they're willing, that they're loved enough to suffer for the sake of the world like I am willing to suffer for the sake of the world. Uh, so you see how that works. You see where that's at. It's a, it's a, it's a really deep concept. It's a really difficult concept, but it's one that's really, really important. Jesus suffered for the world, not because God hated him, but because God loves him. Jesus suffers for the world, not because God's mad at him, but because God embraces him and cares for him. And that's a very different stance. It's a whole lot harder to watch someone suffer when you love them and you're watching them suffer for a purpose or a cause. It's a whole lot easier to watch someone suffer when you're mad at them or when you're holding a grudge or when you're wanting to beat them down or, or turn your back on them, okay? But what Jesus is Jesus suffering is because God loves them. And so Jesus is saying, look, I want them to know that they're loved in their suffering as well. I want them to know that their suffering comes from love and not from anger or punishment. And I want them to know, God, that the love that you have for me, the trust you have for me is going to be in them. So that as they go forward for the sake of the world, they are loved in it and they are loved for it and they're going to be taking care of it. So the love with which you have for me, I want to be in them so that they're willing to go out and suffer the way I'm willing to go out and suffer because that's what's going to be needed. Look, it's clear if, if this ministry is going to move forward, if the work that, that God is doing is going to move forward, it, there's going to be suffering. And if those who are carrying the word aren't willing to suffer, well, then suffering, th- then the word won't carry forth. The word won't continue. The word will fall short. Um, and the ministry will end. And the church will collapse. And nobody wants that. 
Nobody wants the church to collapse. Nobody wants that. So um, that's just the way, that's what Jesus is praying for when he lifts this prayer up. Okay, so uh, there's a lot to that. I just laid a lot out there, um, and uh, some of it's pretty deep, and I get that. And, and, and I hope that you're able to kind of grasp it. If, I, if, if there's anything you have any questions about, again, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to engage. My, my, um, my contact will come up at the end of the session. If you want to ask me questions or make comments, I'm always welcome to hear that and try to do the best I can to answer it. So that's where we're at for now. Um, I'm going to leave it here because we're really, you know, kind of get into um, we're, we're really going to kind of get into the big part next week of the passion. This is where things begin. Uh, so I don't want to jump too deep into that and then either find myself having to stop short or making this session a whole lot longer than I intend to make. I like them to be, you know, a certain length and I don't I try not to go beyond that. So I'm going to leave it here for now. Um, and uh, again, my contact will come up at the end of the session. If you have any questions, please feel free to share this out there. Please feel free to tag me in. I'd love to see where you're at. Feel free to send it out there. Do the work. Um, bring it. Share it so that others can experience what we experience. And once again, as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for being part of this. And we will talk to you again next week.